So with that, um, I'm super excited about our next guest uh, and his talk and about his new social network that he's building as a public utility, which as you know, with the Facebook whistleblower, um, you know, everything that is in the news today, I think this is a, a very relevant talk and why we need something like this. So let me introduce George. George A. Polisner is the founder of the nonprofit Civic Works. Prior to founding Civic Works, George worked in product development, performance engineering, service design, and management at Oracle Corporation. He published his res resignation letter from Oracle as a protest when the co-CEO of Oracle joined the Trump administration's transition team. His letter was covered by major news outlets and was viewed over 350,000 times. Please welcome George. Thanks very much, Shelby. I George. appreciate the introduction as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to start this conversation by asking you about, I mean, I can't let you go on to your talk without asking you about this letter of resignation that is so much talked about, right? So you want to give a brief overview to our viewers and audience, and then we'll we'll talk about your social network. Sure. Uh, and it, there's a funny backstory to it as well. Uh, but <clears throat> there was no communication internally at Oracle. Uh, and I actually just found out in the news back in, uh, I think it was around the November, uh, December 2016 timeframe that uh, the co-CEO, uh, Safra Katz, she was co-CEO at the time, uh, had joined the Trump transition team and had uh, stated that we're here to help you in any way that we can. Uh, and I had very strong concerns as anyone that uh, saw the letter uh, that was published on LinkedIn knows uh, because at the same time, uh, the administration was talking about the creation of a Muslim database uh, and other issues that, of course, this audience uh, would be very sensitive to and uh, would probably respond in the same way that I did. And so I wrote a very pointed letter. I mean, I recognized too that I was at a point in time in my career where I was able to make that statement. I mean, I, uh, I'm an, an old guy, Michael, in the last presentation was talking about data as the new oil. And I'm thinking, well, I'm a dinosaur. So that's perfect transition uh, over to my presentation. But in any event, uh, a lot of the things that I pointed out in that letter, I think it was about two pages about my concerns uh, with Oracle, with Safra Katz joining uh, the transition team and with the the kind of future that I thought this country would have uh, in an administration that was making fear and hate, uh, you know, key parts of the platform, uh, uh, lies. Uh, uh, and so anyways, uh, when, I, when I published that letter, my kids had joined me for winter break uh, and we were watching on LinkedIn. And I remember seeing, you know, about a thousand people had seen the letter. And so we were thinking, wow, this is, uh, this is impressive. Uh, and within, I think, uh, about a week, it had gone to about 350,000 views uh, and then had coverage by the New York Times and The Guardian. Um, and so uh, at the same time, uh, I was having great discussions with Golda Velez, who, uh, whose presentation folks heard a little while ago. And it's very hard to follow Golda because she's brilliant. Uh, and uh, and I am really deeply grateful and honored for the, the types of things that she's doing and the impacts that she's having in the area of human rights. Uh, but Golda, as well as Adam Lake, uh, and I were having discussions about uh, the potential, uh, what CivWorks would look like, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, in the presentation. I'll let you continue, George. Do you have slides to share? I do. Uh, I think I can share my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Let me see if I can do this. And Shopi, are folks seeing uh, the presentation at this point? Uh, George, I don't see it in the green room yet. Uh, once I see it, I can add it to the stage. Okay. Let me see. So, uh, ah. So choose what to share. Uh, yeah, 
And is that showing up now? It is showing up now and you can okay. go in present mode, George. Oh, very good. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, CivWorks is a, uh, as a social, uh, social media company, as a public utility. Uh, first, a couple of key things. Uh, most slides that you will see in this presentation won't be as text heavy as the next one. Uh, and I've consumed copious amounts of coffee and so don't worry, we're gonna get through the next 34 slides rapidly. So there'll be some time for questions. Uh, and first off, I wanted to thank you, Shilpi, and the Data uh, Ethics for All team for putting this together. And all of you out there that are listening now or may uh, see this presentation later on demand, uh, I wanted to share just a few brief oversimplifications from my uh, long, uh, technology career, which is almost 40 years, which also means I'm a very bad investor because most of my friends retired <laughs> retired long ago. They got into Unix and, and the industry uh, when I did. But in terms of my observations, the very first phase uh, of the industry was really a data collection, processing and storage phase. The second phase was now that we have uh, some data sets, how do we harvest that data to drive uh, business outcomes uh, or public sector outcomes in the area of sales, profits, record keeping, efficiency. The third phase uh, is the big data advanced analytics and starting to use psychometrics to uh, track and drive behaviors, whether they be consumer behaviors uh, or political behaviors. And the fourth phase that we're talking about really now is the application of AI to drive outcomes, automation, and the potential that we're seeing to exacerbate inequality by being able to create economic models uh, like uh, things like Uber uh, and others in a gig-based economy uh, where money is really flowing uh, to, uh, to an investor class in a very concentrated way. Uh, and my other observation, again, this is an oversimplification that ethics and technology has largely long been related to uh, some uh, checkbox data privacy language, uh, usually in a 20-page terms of use. And so, uh, again, the thinking behind data ethics for all and really trying to move ethics into the DNA of the technology space uh, is something that I really applaud and am very grateful for uh, knowing Shilpi and, and the work that the team is doing. So <clears throat> ethics and social media, uh, we know uh, from Facebook and Twitter and other models. That Sorry, social George? Yes. Your presentation is not moving forward. Are you moving it forward? Uh, I am. Uh, and so let me see. It's moving forward on my screen. Uh, and unfortunately, it sounds like it's not moving forward on anyone else's. Let me just see. Sometimes it, it does that and uh, <laughs> technology yeah. can't live with it, can't live without it. <laughs> that is true. So I don't know if it's. Okay, there. Now it is. Um, okay. Now it's moving, George. Okay. And if you want to Perfect. try the present mode, George, that will it'll be become, it'll be bigger. Uh, let's see. Okay. George, on your right right hand corner of your screen, where there is a slider for Zoom, uh, the fourth button uh, is right next to the slider. The left of the slider is a present mode. Okay, and yeah, is that that's... okay? Good. Uh, and hopefully, this will update the screen as I move through. Uh, <clears throat> so let me know, Shelby, if if uh, this is updated. Uh, it did not go in present mode, and it's not. Can, can you? I'm not sure. Can you move the, the slide one up or down? It's 
it didn't go in present mode let me to remove it and add it again let's not worry about present mode uh george can you try going up or down the slide sure is that updating i think it's updating so okay. then you're good yeah very, very good so sorry about the eye test folks uh, but anyways, I'll talk to these slides and, and I'm happy to certainly share them uh, with, with folks that are interested in seeing the actual uh, presentation deck. But anyways, we know that social platforms thrive on conflict and controversy. And we also know that, that user interactions with the commercial platforms like Facebook, uh, the user interactions are the product. You are essentially the product. So your posts and comments, uh, your profile, uh, is really a goldmine for sales and marketing efforts, as well as political operatives that we saw uh, in the 2016 presidential campaign, as well as in Brexit. Uh, we know that Facebook was working very closely with Cambridge Analytica. Uh, we know that Steve Bannon uh, was very involved in Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and uh, I think everyone here knows this story. Uh, that there was involvement by a, uh, a billionaire in the U.S., Robert Mercer, uh, Steve Bannon, Cambridge, and Facebook. And they were very influential in tar sending targeted messages based upon uh, psychometric data that they collected uh, on individual users. Uh, and they did this uh, to support both Brexit uh, and the Trump administration. And so here... Uh, we see Robert Mercer working on one side. Uh, we know that state actors in Russia, as part of the Robert Mueller investigation, were also working to disseminate propaganda uh, and lies to influence uh, the election in the U.S., as well as uh, the vote in the U.K. <clears throat> we also know that in any kind of publicly traded entity, commercial entity, uh, the thought of data protection represents a cost or an investment that somebody like Facebook or Twitter uh, or any of the commercial entities need to make. Uh, and you know, one would ask if their core mission is not to protect people's data, uh, how much money are they really going to be spending uh, to protect uh, information and uh, here we see uh, some fairly, uh, fairly recent information from another huge data breach at Facebook uh, and uh, it, Facebook's response uh, internally was, you know, pretty much ho-hum. Uh, that's the way it goes. And, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, anyways, we know that democracy demands a well-educated, well-informed and engaged society. Uh, and we also know uh, from experience that democracy and the kind of extreme wealth concentration that we see now uh, in the U.S. and around the world simply cannot coexist. You have too much wealth and power concentrated into the hands of a few. Uh, and so that certainly makes any aspiration of democracy uh, a very large challenge. It's an impediment. Uh, not that everybody... Uh, uh, should essentially just be distributed equal amounts of wealth, uh, but certainly not the kind of inequity that exists within the system now uh, that has been colored by generations of bias uh, and racism and misogyny. So uh, CivWorks, uh, gee, I was told not to be political. I hope I'm not being political. Uh, <clears throat> CivWorks is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that we launched uh, back in February of 2017. It was launched fairly quickly after the elections in the US. Uh, what we wanted to do is to provide an advertising free uh, subscription based social platform uh, that did not sell any subscriber data or share uh, any data. And we think of ourselves as a long term countervailing infrastructure to address the Lewis Powell memo. And I granted that's not a good uh, tagline uh, for a business, uh, but uh, just to provide a little context, I'll get, into, I'll get into what I mean by that in just a minute. Uh, this is a look at the web-based platform for CivWorks. 
Uh, and so it, it is a uh, social network that's providing an outlet, a mechanism for people to post uh, and perform a lot of your fundamental, uh, fundamental resources that you would expect from the social uh, media, uh, social network. Uh, obviously, we don't have the kind of funding that a Facebook or Twitter or other uh, model would have as a nonprofit. We, we rely on uh, really subscribers that want to support us and provide a small monthly recurring donation uh, to support our operations and development. Uh, earlier this year, we launched uh, native iOS and Android versions of CivWorks. And so I was very, very happy to, to get that done and get that effort funded. It's something that's been on our engineering list for a while. Uh, and so we'll continue to make improvements as we can to the web, iOS, and Android areas. <clears throat> Why CivWorks? Uh, one, we don't sell or share subscriber data. Uh, we're ad-free. It's free to use our platform, uh, although we certainly appreciate when folks uh, that want to chip in, chip in a, a few bucks a month. We think of it as kind of the Netflix for democracy model. Uh, uh, we want to gamify civic actions and education. And, uh, and so when people take an action, when people attend a town hall meeting uh, with a local, a local official uh, or a senator or a congressperson uh, or where they, they send a letter to an editor uh, for an issue, other types of civic actions, we want to gamify that because we know uh, hardcore activists are going to do it and that's great. But we see that there is a massive part of the center, the middle part uh, of any society that really needs uh, to be nurtured and supported in terms of their engagement. And so we, we seek to provide civic action opportunities for them and to also provide uh, a uh, feedback mechanism for them to continue to support even competitive behavior with regard to taking action. And for our future, uh, we are very anxious to be able to get to the point where uh, we can incorporate some of the ideas that Golda has spoken about earlier and others of you have spoken about in terms of really being anti-propaganda, to be able to have uh, new source ratings and information ratings on the site. Uh, we also want to extend to uh, provide information about corporate social behavior, how a company is behaving. Are they, uh, are they uh, mitigating their environmental footprint are they providing uh, a equitable salary, fair, in, in, in embracing fair labor? We want to be able to provide information to people that can either act civically, politically, or economically in terms of how they spend their money or how they invest their money. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit uh, briefly about our future uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> in terms of really trying to facilitate discussions and outcomes among people that may not politically agree. Uh, we think that that's very, very important instead of just people shouting at each other, uh, which has become uh, the common uh, method of communication, uh, sadly, in the US and around the world. Just briefly, uh, when I talk about the Lewis Powell memo, we know that in the 1960s uh, 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 that there were many different uh, uh, entities that really came together and united across traditional lines, whether it be the peace movement, the labor movements, women's rights, civil rights, uh, they came together. They saw uh, that uh, through, through protest uh, and through marching and through activism, they were really able to make significant gains in the 1960s with regard to uh, civil rights and women's rights and uh, peace and, and the, the union strengthening of unions. And <clears throat> what we saw in the 1970s, for folks that haven't read it, it's really important reading in terms of at least U.S. Uh, history, uh, because a lot of what we see today uh, in terms of the concentration of wealth, uh, the uh, media propagation of media messages really started with the Lewis Powell memo that he wrote 
uh, it's a brilliant memo. Uh, it has been used for purposes that really have uh, supported the uh, the one percent, the further of, of wealth concentration in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, but it's 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 very written very collegially, and uh, it's a it's a very smart architecture for long-term infrastructure for the one percent. Uh, and it's been uh, very successfully applied uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, and, uh, and so I encourage everybody that hasn't seen it to, to, to look for the memo uh, from August 23rd, 1971. Uh, it defined uh, the conservative machine. It talked about the formation of ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, many of you know that this is an entity that is behind a lot of very bad policy and legislation in the US, stand your ground laws, voter suppression, and so-called right to work uh, is all, the, all, all emanated from what Powell wrote about, the emergence of right-wing think tanks, uh, which have led to climate change denial, uh, uh, a lot of propaganda around uh, climate change and the oil companies for, for generations, uh, media consolidation. At one point in time, there were about 90 uh, independent media companies, which are now down to, I think, five or six. Uh, and tying academic funding, university funding, uh, to conservative representation and propagate, propagation of conservative ideas and thought uh, is all part of the Lewis Powell memo. And so from that, we see uh, this. Uh, it's uh, the GOP. Uh, is very connected to ALEC uh, and a lot of the funding that comes out of the Koch brothers, the Walton family, uh, and others uh, that work to really uh, further laws that will concentrate wealth and exacerbate uh, wealth inequality and climate change denial uh, and uh, <clears throat> privatization uh, and uh, erosion of public schools and universities. And so uh, a lot of propaganda uh, emanated uh, from, uh, from the evolution of what Lewis Powell wrote about, as well as the distribution of uh, hate and fear-based messaging uh, across various uh, networks, whether they be radio, uh, TV broadcasts, or social media. And uh, wealth inequality, uh, again, uh, it's our fundamental belief that you cannot have massive wealth uh, inequity uh, and support democracy at the same time. Uh, you just can't concentrate uh, extreme wealth and power into the hands of a few and expect to have a representative democracy. Uh, and this problem, of course, for those that are familiar with the Citizens United, uh, uh, versus the FEC decision, it has been exacerbated by uh, that Supreme Court decision. So in countervailing the Powell machine, as I, I talked about, uh, we uh, want to uh, gather, essentially we want to provide a social media platform for people to use as they would a conventional social platform, but to also uh, to be able to cultivate virtual flash mobs to help drive policy and action that can provide uh, uh, human rights, civic rights, expand civic rights, address climate and do other things to support uh, issue focused campaigns and uh, political advocacy groups. And so in working with organizations uh, like the below, uh, anti-corruption, uh, climate action, uh, racial justice, uh, and other, other organizations, LGBTQ community, uh, we want to really help drive, uh, resist, first of all, bad policy and legislation and strategically drive uh, comprehensive good policy uh, where we can, that can strengthen democracy over time. Uh, <clears throat> two, two more minutes, George. Okay, and, uh, and so eight slides, that's about 15 seconds a slide. <laughs> no worries. Uh, and so anyways, uh, Golda, Adam, uh, and myself started talking about what can we do about the corrupting influence of money uh, and the demise of democracy. 
Uh, this was uh, coverage from The Guardian on the resignation letter uh, that I wrote uh, back in uh, November, December of 2016. And CivWorks was formed and we started as a concept. Uh, we wanted to be the people's ALEC initially and be a, an index database of good policy and model law and legislation that people could use. Uh, but we determined working directly with legislation and policy is a pretty heavy lift uh, for the average citizen. And we wanted to support sustained and effective civic action. Uh, we didn't want to be another site just simply collecting petitions uh, like, hey, Mitch McConnell just sneezed, uh, sign our petition and send us money. Uh, we really wanted to have an impact on uh, state, local, regional, uh, national, and even international uh, actions. And so uh, we uh, started to develop mechanisms and what you probably can't see in this eye chart, uh, but on our site, uh, what we do is we publish uh, actions that people can take uh, that are effective actions, either toward uh, civic education or taking direct action, showing up at a local uh, school board candidate debate or showing up at a town hall meeting uh, or other uh, opportunities for action uh, and education uh, for themselves, their families, and communities. And so there it is looking a little bit bigger. You can see ACT Now is featured. Uh, we want to support sustained meaning, meaningful civic action. So there's a spectrum of actions which are effective, really a hierarchy of actions that go all the way from uh, going to a town hall meeting to show your interest uh, in uh, political decisions that are being made by elected officials uh, through letters to the editor, all the way to supporting a run for office, which is a pretty heavy lift from a civic action perspective. Uh, we also uh, continue to work on making sure that civic actions have visibility directly to a user or subscriber, uh, something that's happening in their own backyard or at their local library, uh, we want to let them know. And so uh, we do some cross-matching between uh, a subscriber's location, what their issue, interest, or focus is, and the actions that flow through our system. And uh, <clears throat> people register, sign up for free, and identify, they self-identify the issues that are of interest to them. Uh, and, uh, and then our engineering priorities uh, over the next few years as we can afford to fund them. Uh, our we've uh, built the native mobile apps. Uh, we want to provide the index legislative database and model policy and law that people can find and select maybe anti-fracking bills for their counties or local areas. We want to develop a comprehensive uh, education curriculum around effective civic action. Uh, and we want to be able to provide news source and journalist trust ratings even in, a very, even in their infancy, they're very, very important uh, to combat propaganda uh, and issues that we have seen and will continue to see that will evolve uh, very, very quickly and create more of a threat to democracy in the US and around the world. Uh, and some other things that we're exploring, such as blockchain uh, and offshoring uh, a subpoena-proof database to protect privacy for uh, our community uh, and enhance security for the site. Uh, and marketing, marketing priorities are, uh, uh, of course, interesting to us. Facebook often takes care of a lot of our marketing for us because every two or three months they're in the news uh, uh, doing some pretty bad things, which makes people uh, more interested in our work. And so uh, anyways, uh, I hope this has been useful and, and Shilpi, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions if there are any questions folks may have. Thank you, George. Uh, very interesting talk and the work that you, uh, Golda and Adam uh, are doing and the team at Civic Works. Uh, kudos to you all. Um, any special questions we have from the audience? Um, so Golda says that um, I think the payment model for civic works is what makes it uh, have unique drivers. We, uh, it's interesting. When we initially started with the platform, uh, 
we wanted to make it free for students and teachers to use. Uh, and we wanted uh, uh, to then have paid subscribers as well. Uh, and what we found was putting any kind of economic barrier in place really greatly constrains growth. And so we decided to open the platform up for free for anyone, uh, but then adopt the guardian type subscription model where folks that really believe in our concept and work can contribute a small uh, recurring monthly donation, which helps us offset our operations costs as well as uh, developing new features and functions as quickly as we can. Yeah, so I heard that uh, there is a freemium model and then, but it's not enforced. Uh, it's free for all and anybody, it is a 501c3 and you would like support. And so if anybody um, wants to pay and get on the premium model, they can just for supporting you. So is there any long-term sustainable plan for this? Uh, there, there are there are several uh, that we're exploring, but certainly require us to grow to a certain scale. And one of them that we want to support is uh, folks that, that interact with social media uh, quite frequently. Uh, you might see Governor Kate Brown up in Oregon uh, meeting with fir first responders and publishing a post on Facebook about wildfire and climate change. Uh, and typically there'll be some supportive messages and then there'll be thousands of uh, uh, d divisive, derisive messages from uh, people in West Virginia or elsewhere that have are not part of our constituency. Uh, what we want to do is to incorporate, once we gain a little scale, a model in which elected officials can effectively have rooms that are with their validated constituents and that they can do uh, direct polling and really conduct virtual town halls as a way to support uh, more participatory democracy. And so that is a model uh, where we would shift uh, this, uh, a premium subscription option to the elected official or the elected agency or body, uh, which can then really help our, our growth. Uh, and so there, there is that. Uh, we also, uh, as part of that model, are looking to have constituents or our subscribers uh, verify themselves, so verify their physical location. And so we would charge an annual, a small annual fee for that. And that, again, would help us uh, generate uh, uh, operational and development revenue. But right now, uh, we are all volunteers uh, and, uh, and, and some of us are really old. So that makes it even, even worse, she'll be. Old is gold, uh, George. And I know that uh, I want to say this publicly. Uh, you are so good. And I have uh, had the honor of inviting you to become a data ethics for all advisor. And I hope that you will consider it and you will accept it. And I'm still waiting on your confirmation. I know verbally you have, but uh, it isn't official yet. So I love everything that you're doing. And I would love to have you on board. Well, I'm, I'm honored, Shilpi, and, and with witnesses on this call, I will send an email <laughs> confirmation. Uh, but no, I, I, I really support the, the concept and, and the ideas are so important to our future. Uh, I tend to think of reacting to the fires that are burning out of control right now uh, from a societal and global perspective. And you're already, you already are optimistic thinking that that I can solve some of those problems and that we can have a future in which ethics will be incredibly important. We are all optimistic, George. Who knows what, where we will go or what we will be able to accomplish. Uh, but we, you, we have to start somewhere and that's what all of us are doing. I want to take a question from Rakesh Ranjan. He says, George, your effort in creating an alternative platform to address civic issues is commendable. And you touched upon the elected officials and he, he touched upon that exactly. Does this platform take issues with our elected officials? So can we take our grievances to our politicians? <laughs> we, we, def we, we definitely want to have that dialogue. Uh, and another friend of ours uh, who, who is, uh, I'm a huge fan of hers, is Colleen Hardwick. And she created up in Canada a platform called PlaySpeak, uh, P-L-A-C-E, Speak. Uh, and uh, a lot of the concepts in that platform we want to integrate into CivWorks, which will allow that uh, verified constituent dialogue with a public official. Uh, and so we want, we, what the, if I think about the future of CivWorks, 
I think of uh, uh, perhaps a, uh, a uh, state legislator up in Oregon uh, talking directly to his district and people that are, that are verified to be part of his district saying, hey, there's a vote coming up next week on alternative fuels. Here are the issues here. I'm thinking, here's what I'm thinking about in terms of voting. Uh, what are your thoughts about this and being able to have votes from the community? Because when you think about it, the physical town hall meetings, mm -hmm. city council meetings, supervisor meetings, uh, they're typically at night. Uh, you get a very small, narrow cross section of people that can attend those meetings. Uh, and so I really would like to open this up to an entire community, people that are working two jobs to just be able to pay rent if they're lucky enough to have jobs, aren't going to be able to go to those, those meetings. But being able to attend virtually and weigh in on issues, to me, that's what democracy is all about. I, I love this, George, because this is truly uh, inclusion, diversity, inclusion in action, right? I mean, it's like people who who we think their voices, uh, like others think their voices are not as important or they cannot give the time of the day. Uh, you're making it accessible and you're making it democratizing it to make every voice important and heard. Um, and I love that. So kudos to you and your team, George. And yes, uh, we are already seeing welcome advisor uh, post on the comments. So <laughs> you are official, George. Thank you so much for your time today. Great talk. And we'll continue the conversation. Take care. Thank you very much, Shilpi. Bye, everyone.